Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us for the People's Choice topic of inflammatory breast cancer. I would like to start by thanking so many people and organizations that have worked over the last years to increase awareness of this disease, including the IBC International Consortium and many organizations led by IBC patient advocates, such as the IBC Research Foundation and the IBC Network Foundation, among others. I think that we have come a long way in terms of recognizing this disease, the challenges that our patients diagnosed with IBC face, and as well the challenges that we healthcare providers face in the clinic when trying to make the best decisions for our patients. So for that reason, I'm very happy to have these three excellent panelists that will cover the genomics of IBC, surgical controversies and radiation therapy controversies in inflammatory breast cancer. After their talks, uh, there will be a panel discussion and we'll be joined by three IBC patient advocates that will bring us their perspective uh, of this disease. So before we get started, I would just like to review how we diagnosed inflammatory breast cancer. So according to the eighth edition of the American Joint Committee on Cancer, inflammatory breast cancer is defined as a combination of typical clinical findings after confirmation of invasive breast cancer. Inflammatory breast cancer, as we all know, is designated as T4D. Therefore, any patient diagnosed with inflammatory breast cancer has either stage three or stage four disease, depending on the absence or the presence of distant metastasis. Clinical characteristics typical of IBC include breast erythema, edema, with or without spot orange, warm breast, but very importantly is that not always these patients have uh, an underlying palpable mass. The erythema involving the breast often involves a third or more of the skin of the breast, and these findings are characterized by a rapid evolution from first symptom to diagnosis of less than six months, which helps make the distinction of other cases of locally advanced breast cancer that is not IBC. Our patients are often initially told to have a mastitis, and not uncommonly, before they start a diagnosis of breast cancer, they have received one or more courses of antibiotics. So dermal lymphatic involvement is a pathologic hallmark of inflammatory breast cancer that is present in the majority of the cases. However, dermal lymphatic invasion alone in the absence of the typical clinical findings is not sufficient to make the, the diagnosis, and the opposite is true as well. The presence of, uh, the absence of dermal lymphatic invasion in the presence of the typical clinical findings does not exclude the diagnosis of IBC. So the diagnosis of inflammatory breast cancer, as you can see, can be affected by ambiguity in the diagnosis, the fact that the diagnosis is overly dependent on provider's experience, and these, as you can appreciate, can compromise IBC-specific IBC research efforts by including patients that do not have IBC in IBC-specific uh, projects. Further, compromising efforts to identify uh, driver mechanisms of this disease, and soon we will hear more about that. So a few years ago, an IBC task force was brought together uh, by Susan G. Komen, the Milburn Foundation, and the IBC Research Foundation. And they brought together a group of experts that reviewed clinical, molecular, and pathological characteristics often associated with inflammatory breast cancer. These groups selected seven characteristics and gave to each a priority factor based on its importance. 
this scoring system also has included photographies that reflect different skin tones to try to help the healthcare providers identify them in the clinic. So different scoring thresholds and categories were defined in an effort to try to help make treatment recommendations as well as identify patients that should be included in IBC dedicated clinical trials. You see here the QR codes that can take you directly to that scoring system. This system requires validation and there's an ongoing uh, project, research project that is trying to validate and or refine if needed this new proposed scoring system using a combined uh, approach, looking at the combined database of the IBC databases already existing at Dana-Farber and MD Anderson. So without further ado, I would like to introduce Dr. Frederick Howard from the University of Chicago that will talk to us about the genomics in IBC. Thanks so much, Dr. Lentz. Um, so uh, I'd like to also thank the organizers for inviting me to talk at this educational session today. And today I'm gonna to be talking about studies to try to answer whether inflammatory breast cancer is a genomically different type of cancer. I have no disclosures. So I'll first start with just some brief background information about inflammatory breast cancer and spend most of the time talking about studies comparing uh, mutational profiles or gene expression patterns between inflammatory and non-inflammatory cases. And then I'll also spend some time talking about the unique role of the immune microenvironment in inflammatory breast cancer. As we just heard, inflammatory breast cancer has this distinct clinical presentation with inflammatory changes or erythema that occurs rapidly. Uh, and it also has some unique pathologic findings like the presence of tumor emboli within dermal lymphatic spaces. However, the pathologic findings are neither necessary or sufficient for the diagnosis. So it's a clinical diagnosis and that adds to the complexity of genomic studies because cases can be mischaracterized. In addition, inflammatory breast cancer is rare, which adds to the challenge of its study. In large data sets like SEER, inflammatory breast cancer constitutes only about 2 to 3 percent of breast cancer diagnoses. Inflammatory breast cancer has a unique receptor profile. Uh, there's about an equal proportion of uh, triple negative, HER2 positive, and hormone receptor positive, HER2 negative cases of inflammatory breast cancer, which is different than the general population of uh, cases of breast cancer. In addition, inflammatory breast cancer occurs at a younger age and elevated body mass index is associated with an increased risk for inflammatory breast cancer. And there are also some disparities in the disease. Inflammatory breast cancer occurs at a higher rate in black women in the United States, and uh, black women also suffer from a greater risk of mortality when they do develop the disease. So here are some of the studies that have compared. There's been a number of studies comparing mutational profiling of inflammatory and non-inflammatory breast cancer, and I've chosen some of the largest ones here. And what you can see is that some of the earlier studies looked at mutations on targeted sequencing patterns in inflammatory breast cancer and found that inflammatory cases had more frequent mutations and they had more common mutations in TP53, PIK3CA, ERBB2, or HER2. Um, but these earlier studies were of insufficient size to adjust for the differences in receptor profile. And this raises some questions. We know TP53 mutations occur at a higher rate in triple negative breast cancer. So is the higher rate in inflammatory breast cancer just due to the greater portion of triple negative disease? Subsequent studies have conducted larger scale analyses and have found some, genome, some studies have found genomic pathways that are altered at a greater frequency in inflammatory breast cancer, even controlling for receptor subtype, with pathways uh, altered including notch, DNA repair, cell cycle and RAS, uh, RAFMAP kinase pathways. Some studies have also shown higher tumor mutational burden in inflammatory breast cancer. But these findings are not unanimous, and there are also several large studies that have found that the genomic profile of inflammatory and non-inflammatory cancers are similar when controlling for receptor subtype. So this is one of the larger studies that looked at 156 cases of inflammatory breast cancer that had undergone targeted sequencing and compared them to nearly 200 cases from the Cancer Genome Atlas. 
This study demonstrated higher rates of mutations in DNA repair, notch, RAS, uh, RAFMAP kinase, and cell cycle pathways. And these differences were significant in the hormone receptor positive HER2 negative subgroup. And several of these differences were also significant in other subgroups as well. Similar findings were shown in this, this other large study that looked at 100, uh, over 100 patients with inflammatory breast cancer and compared them to uh, over 2,000 patients from the Cancer Genome Atlas and Metabric. And this study found that there were a number of genes that were differentially altered in inflammatory and non-inflammatory breast cancer. And again, we see that in particular, there were a lot of alterations in the DNA repair and notch pathways among inflammatory cases. And these differences were significant even when controlling for molecular subtype, tumor stage, and the type of sequencing that was performed. Additionally, when looking at the mutations in the notch pathway, the most common alterations, uh, notch 2, notch 4, and the Krebs binding protein, we can see that these mutations didn't often occur together. They appeared to be mutually exclusive for the most part, suggesting that this may be an important step in the development of inflammatory breast cancer. However, again, these findings are not seen in all studies. Uh, this is data from a study presented this week at San Antonio that, compared, that evaluated 140 inflammatory breast cancer cases from Dana-Farber and found that in many of these pathways, there wasn't increased rates of alterations in inflammatory breast cancer, uh, except for maybe increased rates of TP53 mutations in the hormone receptor positive subgroup. Nonetheless, there are several studies implicating NOTCH in the biology of inflammatory breast cancer. So a little bit about NOTCH. Uh, NOTCH is a cell-cell signaling pathway. Essentially, when NOTCH binds to a ligand in a neighboring cell, it stretches the protein apart. The protein can be cleaved by gamma secretase, and then the internal part of the protein can go on and lead to transcription of target genes. I mention this because some of you may have heard of gamma secretase inhibitors. That's been one of the attempts to try to target the NOTCH pathway in the past, although this hasn't been that clinically successful. NOTCH has a number of important downstream effects, including promoting angiogenesis, promoting cancer stem cell-like behavior, and it can also allow cells to survive when separated from the extracellular matrix. And I think all of these biologic features are reminiscent of inflammatory breast cancer, where you may need this cancer stem cell behavior to have tumor emboli that are proliferating in distant sites. We also see evidence that NOTCH may be important in preclinical models of inflammatory breast cancer. So this is data from a patient-derived cell line of inflammatory breast cancer that was found to overexpress NOTCH3. And what's seen is when these cells are grown in a suspension is that they form these tight clusters called spheroids. And this is thought to indicate cancer stem cell behavior because you need to have the ability to self-replicate and renew to be able to form these spheroids. And what the study found is that if you turn off that NOTCH3 overexpression, these spheroids are, are disrupted and undergo peripheral apoptosis. In addition, in a patient-derived xenograft model of the same uh, cell line, turning off NOTCH with gamma secretase inhibitor induces apoptosis and also reduces tumor growth. So basically, NOTCH is important for both the cancer stem cell biology as well as the tumor growth of inflammatory breast cancer. Now, there are other pathways that we saw were altered in NOTCH uh, at a higher rate, including the cell cycle and RASMAP kinase pathways. And this might just be a reflection of the need for proliferative pathways to support the characteristic rapid growth of inflammatory breast cancer. However, there are studies suggesting that these pathways may be synergistic with NOTCH. Uh, in the preclinical model shown to the right, NOTCH expression alone was insufficient for the development of tumors or for the growth of cancer. But NOTCH expression in combination with either RAS on the top or proficient cyclin D1, a cell cycle enzyme on the bottom, uh, resulted in tumor growth or tumorogenesis. So we've talked a bit about the mutations in inflammatory breast cancer, and I also want to talk about gene expression profiling. Uh, or in other words, instead of how genes are mutated, how the genes are turned on and off in this type of cancer. Uh, 
And when th these studies show clustering, and clustering is when you take a bunch of cases and you see where the gene expression pro identify groups of cases where the gene expression profiling is similar between cases. And what you can see is when you do cluster this type of clustering with inflammatory and non-inflammatory breast cancer cases, that you get clusters that are essentially representing the classic molecular subtypes of breast cancer, luminal, HER2 enriched, and basal, but what you don't get is a unique cluster of inflammatory breast cancer cases. So essentially, the molecular differences here are really being driven by the classic molecular subtypes. And we can see similar findings even when looking in a one subtype of inflammatory breast cancer, triple negative inflammatory breast cancer. This study looked at the rates of categorization in the six molecular subtypes of triple negative breast cancer defined by Brian Lehman and colleagues. And what they found is looking at 90 cases of inflammatory and non-inflammatory breast cancer that all six of the subtypes were essentially equally represented more or less between inflammatory and non-inflammatory cases. There might have been a slightly higher rate of the mesenchymal stem cell-like behavior and lower rate of the immunomodulatory behavior in inflammatory cases. But essentially, there's not just a unique pathway to development of triple negative inflammatory breast cancer. All, all of these subtypes were represented. Now, a number of studies have tried to hone down on a smaller subset of genes that may more precisely distinguish inflammatory and non-inflammatory cases. And I've shown some of these studies here. And when you look at the genes included or identified by these studies, you can see some of the pathways we've discussed earlier, MAP kinase, cell cycle, and NOTCH. But we also see some other new pathways we haven't discussed, including inflammatory signaling pathways, NF-kappa-beta, interferon, and some macrophage signals. And we can also see hemoglobin genes may have been important to distinguish inflammatory breast cancer in two studies. Now, I do want to note that although all these studies had shown some accuracy in distinguishing inflammatory and non-inflammatory cases, that these results are inconsistent. When you look at the study highlighted to the right, which evaluated the first four signatures on the prior slide in three different data sets of inflammatory and non-inflammatory cases, no signature consistently differentiated inflammatory from non-inflammatory breast cancer. And even when there was a trend or some significant difference, there was still a great deal of overlap between the inflammatory and non-inflammatory cases. What's more is if you look at the genes in these first four signatures, is that there's actually only one gene in common between these signatures, suggesting that there's a lack of consistency in the findings when you're trying to differentiate these inflammatory and non-inflammatory cases. So we also saw that uh, there were some unique findings in inflammatory breast cancer, and one that was suggested was hemoglobin gene expression. And I thought this was interesting. Uh, it may, you may think that hemoglobin gene expression could be due to hemorrhage within tumors, and this could just be representative of red blood cells that are in the tumor. But studies have actually shown that hemoglobin genes can be expressed in cancer, and when expressed in breast cancer, they're associated with increased markers of aggressiveness, like invasion and elevated KI-67. In addition, this may have a biologic role. Some preclinical studies show that expressing hemoglobin genes may protect cells from toxicity from reactive oxygen species in blood. So this expression may be adaptive, allowing cells to travel in the blood and promoting bloodborne metastasis. Additionally, we saw that immune genes may differentiate inflammatory and non-inflammatory cancers. Um, and so the, these, the gene expression may be coming not from the tumor itself in these cases, but from the microenvironment. But I think still, since it's showing up on these gene expression studies, it could be covered in the purview of a talk on the genomics of inflammatory breast cancer. And what you can see is that uh, in, inflammatory breast cancer is thought to recruit monocytes from the blood and differentiate these monocytes into M2 macrophages. These M2 macrophages use cytokines like interleukins, IL-6, IL-8, and those stimulate the inflammatory breast cancer uh, along the JAK-STAT pathway, 
and that promotes cancer stem cell behavior as well as a mesenchymal phenotype. I think this pathway is also interesting because one of the clinical trials evaluating therapies specifically for inflammatory breast cancer that's ongoing is with the drug ruxolitinib, which targets this pathway. <clears throat> there are also several preclinical studies that demonstrate this, highlight this role of macrophages in inflammatory breast cancer. This study looked at two non-inflammatory cell lines at the top and two inflammatory cell lines at the bottom. And what they found is that when exposing these cell lines to media that had been cultured with macrophages, highlighted in the black bars, that the inflammatory cell lines exhibited a high degree of migration. They were very active in response to this. And this is mediated by, again, interleukins, IL-6, 8, and 10. Culture with macrophages can also promote the cancer stem cell phenotype of inflammatory breast cancer and spheroid formation and this can be blocked with anti-IL-6 antibodies. So macrophages can promote this aggressive biology of inflammatory breast cancer. And inflammatory breast cancer recruits macrophages from the blood. This was a uh, cell line model that uh, the investigators evaluated the chemokines produced by the model, and they found that the one that's being produced in the highest quantity is called CCL2. When they blocked this chemokine, they found that the tumor doesn't grow as much. And this is due to in reduced recruitment of macrophages. You can see the tumor with the CCL2 knockdown on the bottom doesn't have as much of the brown staining from the macrophages. And I thought this model was particularly interesting because when you look at this, uh, this is a patient-derived xenograft model, and when you look at the tumors, uh, you can see that they have this red um, kind of erythematous appearance that's rem reminiscent of inflammatory breast cancer. And when you knock down CCL2, this goes away. So I think this is, highlights that this recruitment of macrophages is important to the phenotype that we see in inflammatory breast cancer. So one more study looking at the immune microenvironment. Um, this study looked at over 100 inflammatory breast cancer cases. And they figured out the cells in the microenvironment by applying cybersort to the gene expression data to deconvolute what cells were present. And they found that the most represented cells were M2 macrophages, and also there were high amounts of CD8 positive T cells and other types of macrophages in inflammatory breast cancer. Additionally, when comparing the immune microenvironment of inflammatory and non-inflammatory cases, they found higher rates of M1 macrophages and a trend towards higher amounts of M2 macrophages. So this again highlights that the immune microenvironment may be distinct and play a unique role in inflammatory breast cancer. So I just want to highlight a few last um, differences that have been noted, specifically because they have led to trials of intervention, specifically in inflammatory breast cancer. Earlier studies have no, noted that inflammatory breast cancer, when reviewing the histology, has much higher rates of angiogenesis, or blood vessel formation. You can see this on the right with the high number of these thin-walled vessels that only have an endothelial lining. It's unclear what drives the an angiogenesis in inflammatory breast cancer. Studies have tried to see if vascular endothelial growth factor, or VEGF, is a driver. However, they have had conflicting results. Some studies have found higher rates of VEGF in inflammatory breast cancer, and others have seen lower levels. Nonetheless, there have been two trials evaluating the anti-VEGF antibody bevacizumab in inflammatory breast cancer. Beverly 1 evaluated an anthracycline followed by taxane chemotherapy regimen with bevacizumab as the neoadjuvant treatment for 100 patients with HER2-negative inflammatory breast cancer. The study demonstrated a complete response rate of about 20%, which is, I think, what you would expect with this type of chemotherapy backbone without bevacizumab. Beverly, too, evaluated the same regimen with the addition of trastuzumab for HER2-positive inflammatory breast cancer uh, in 52 patients. And this study demonstrated a complete response rate of about 64%, an impressive complete response rate even in the hormone receptor-positive subset. I think these responses are comparable to what we expect with modern-day trastuzumab and pertuzumab-containing neoadjuvant regimens 
So this seems perhaps more than you'd expect with the chemotherapy backbone alone. And I, it's unclear if this is related to increased VEGF levels, specifically in HER2-positive inflammatory breast cancer, or if there might be some synergy in HER2-positive cancers in general. Furthermore, EGFR is expressed in a greater amounts in inflammatory breast cancer. And in preclinical studies, blocking EGFR reduces the percentage of cancer stem cells in inflammatory breast cancer models. And so the anti-EGFR antibody, panitumumab, was evaluated in addition to uh, NAB, paclitaxel, and carboplatin, again followed by anthracycline chemotherapy, as the neoadjuvant treatment of HER2-negative inflammatory breast cancer. This study resulted in a complete response rate of about 40% in the triple-negative cohort and 14% in the hormone receptor-positive cohort, which is similar to what we expect with Neoad, the similar chemotherapy backbone without anti-EGFR. And additionally, a study evaluating a similar regimen with panitumumab in, uh, that wasn't restricted to inflammatory triple negative breast cancer had a similar PCR rate, suggesting that there's not a unique sensitivity in inflammatory breast cancer to anti-EGFR therapy. So back to the question that we started with, is inflammatory breast cancer a genomically different type of breast cancer? And it's maybe kind of a cop-out answer, but I think it depends on how you define genomically different. On one hand, the genomic differences between inflammatory and non-inflammatory breast cancer are driven by the receptor subtype. There's not a unique gene expression signature that can consistently identify inflammatory breast cancer cases. And we don't currently have a specific systemic therapy approach that's uniquely more effective in inflammatory breast cancer. On the other hand, there have been multiple studies that have shown, even controlling for receptor subtype, that there may be more frequent alterations in several pathways in inflammatory breast cancer. And there is also work to suggest that the immune microenvironment may play a critical role in the disease. In conclusion, I, I, think of inflam I think of inflammatory breast cancer as similar as how I would think the, about the genomics of breast cancer that can spread to the brain. We know that brain metastasis in breast cancer occurs more commonly in HER2-positive and triple-negative breast cancer. Uh, and so there must be some biologic tropism to this effect. But it can also be the endpoint of any subtype of breast cancer. And I think this is similar with inflammatory breast cancer. You have a common clinical endpoint of rapid growth, inflammatory changes, tumor emboli, that's the result, potential result of multiple different biologic pathways. There's not a single unique genomic pathway to inflammatory breast cancer, but there are some interesting findings that may underlie its biology. The cancer stem cell-like behavior may be necessary to support the growth of these tumor emboli, and that can be driven by NOTCH. Proliferative pathways may be necessary to support the rapid growth of inflammatory breast cancer, including signaling along e HER2, EGFR, the MAP kinase, and cell cycle pathways. And there may be a higher rate of DNA repair and tumor mutational burden within inflammatory breast cancer, which may indicate the need to develop multiple mutations to result in this distinct clinical phenotype. And finally, macrophages play a consistent role in the aggressiveness and pathogenesis of inflammatory breast cancer. Ultimately, inflammatory breast cancer remains a clinically challenging diagnosis with outcomes that are worse than other types of breast cancers. I hope that through understanding the genomics of inflammatory breast cancer will lead to some novel treatments that yield greater efficacy. And I think that by studying treatments in inflammatory breast cancer will ultimately improve outcomes for all patients with breast cancer because these pathways clearly have overlap between inflammatory and non-inflammatory cases. I'd like to uh, thank the organizers for inviting me, uh, Dr. Lentz for moderating the session, as well as all my colleagues at University of Chicago who reviewed this talk, including Drs. Rita Nanda and Nan Chen. And I'd like to thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Howard. That was fantastic. I would like now to invite Dr. Lucci to review with us surgical controversies in inflammatory breast cancer. Dr. Lucci from MD Anderson. Thanks so much, Dr. Lentz, and uh, good afternoon. So 
I, I really want to cover kind of a story of, you know, right now everybody, when we treat breast cancer, we want to de-escalate, right? So we agree there's a good reason for that. We can decrease morbidity, but are there some circumstances where maybe it's not the best approach? And so we're going to look at the data and see are there data to support de-escalation of local regional therapy in inflammatory breast cancer? I have no disclosures. And I don't need to spend a lot of time on the introduction since um, Dr. Lentz already gave a, a nice introduction to this, but I would point out that the reported mortality for inflammatory breast cancer has hovered around 50% in many of the published studies. And I would also like to point out that it remains a clinical diagnosis. And the reason I think that still is important is there's some subjectivity. And so when we look at studies that say it's safe to do breast conserving therapy, it's okay to omit radiation, or maybe you can do sentinel node, are those studies reporting on the same patients? And so I think that's an important concept. Um, I don't need to spend time on the scoring system because we talked about that, though I will say it's obviously important in an area where there can be subjectivity and we're not sure that all reported cases of IBC are the same. And this was the poster presented yesterday for development of the scoring system. And so I want to just point out, first of all, we are fortunate in our institution that we have a multidisciplinary clinic. And in that clinic, we now see over 125 inflammatory breast cancer patients every year. And so one of the ways that we've optimized or tried to reduce subjectivity is have all of the multidisciplinary teams see the patient at one time. So the medical oncologist, the surgical oncologist, radiation oncologist, a dedicated mid-level provider who has a lot of experience with seeing IBC patients all come into the room at the same time. We all elicit a history and, a, and an exam, and then we vote and see, you know, what do we think? And then you add this to your scoring system. We take photographs to document and delineate the extent of the disease at baseline. And so I think that has really helped us to get a, a, gra a grasp on which patients really have IBC and which could be a locally advanced cancer masquerading as IBC. And then, of course, we do expanded imaging. We look at both of the axillae with ultrasound because we found at least 10% of these patients have cross metastasis. And we're not going to talk about that in detail because I know Dr. Bellin's going to discuss that in her, in her talk. But I would say also that we do MRI of chest and brain. And then we look for distant metastasis because, unfortunately, that will be the situation in 30% of the patients that we see. So what has given us the best outcome so far? I would say trimodal therapy. We know that when you use appropriate neoadjuvant chemotherapy, and we can't talk about that because we only have 25 minutes, that's a whole nother talk, but when you use the appropriate neoadjuvant therapy, followed by modified radical mastectomy, which includes removing the lymph nodes from the axilla, and then post-mastectomy radiation therapy, that appears to give us the best outcome. But what appears to be happening is that at least 40% of patients have not received this trimodal care. Now, this is an older study from 2014, and you may say but maybe things have gotten better, but actually maybe they've gotten worse, because if you look at some of the recent studies or surveys um, looking at what are the treatment patterns for inflammatory breast cancer, you can see one of my colleagues, uh, Medeget Tashomi, just did a survey of the American Society of Breast, cancer, breast Surgeons uh, membership and found that a significant number of patients are not receiving mastectomy, and an even higher number are not having axillary dissection for management of the axilla. That's troubling, and that's very recent, just performed end of last year. And then our colleagues at Memorial have a poster tomorrow um, showing that only 25% of the IBC patients received guideline concordant care in their NCDB study. So I would submit that things not, aren't necessarily getting better, and in an era of de-escalation, are they potentially um, not getting guideline care as often. So let's look at the data. Is there sufficient data to say that we should de-escalate in patients with inflammatory breast cancer? So one of the first studies that often comes up is this study from the UK, and this is one patients or, or, or other doctors would say, but there is some data about using breast conserving surgery, right? Well, here's some of the data that I know is, is quoted. This was a retrospective review of a database. They have found 35 patients that were treated with breast conserving surgery and found no difference in survival outcomes. But when you really look through that paper carefully, what you see is that these might not be the same IBC patients that we're seeing. 
In fact, half of the patients almost were treated with neoadjuvant endocrine therapy and had a mean tumor size of three centimeters. On the other hand, the ones that received neoadjuvant chemotherapy had a median tumor size of four centimeters. We just don't see that. We don't see patients with small localized tumors having inflammatory breast cancer. And the outcomes were the same if the patients got neoadjuvant endocrine or chemotherapy. Again, not really consistent with what we see. And if you look at the text carefully, they found a group of patients who had localized tumors as a single mass or two or more masses close to each other who were initially treated with either neoadjuvant chemotherapy or endocrine therapy and subsequently had breast conserving surgery and radiotherapy. Again, not consistent with what we're seeing. These are the kind of patients we see, unfortunately, where I think even any decisions about breast conserving surgery would be really out of the question. Um, we're talking about skin involvement, global involvement, um, just not really appropriate. And finally, if you take a closer look at that study, 50% of the patients in that study had clinically negative nodes. I, I would say that's really shocking to me since you look at some of the other studies, 17% um, clinically negative, 16% clinically negative, and at our institution, 4%. Then again, we're doing routine bilateral axillary ultrasound and FNA, but 4% had negative nodes in the last iteration of, of, of our data review. So I'm going to say that the patients in that study that were used and um, I should say included in this um, study were not the same IBC patients we see, and I don't think this piece of data can be applied. Taking it a step further, there's another database study that makes a bold comment of a standard mastectomy should not be the only recommended surgical treatment option for non-metastatic inflammatory breast cancer. Well, they looked at the um, SEER database and what they found was no difference in the small 150 patient group that had BCT versus modified radical mastectomy, 150 patients out of a total of 3,374. There was no propensity score matching, and if you look at the statistical analysis, it's impossible, I think, to devise any kind of statistical power to make defined conclusions on that. And then are you going to change your practice patterns on, on a database study? And if you want to look at the contrary of that, there was another SEER database study from uh, Jan Wong Musafar said the exact opposite. In 7,300 patients, exclusion or, or lesser surgery than mastectomy produced an inferior outcome significantly worse than those that received mastectomy. And the same thing happened if you omit radiation therapy. So I don't think there's clear data to suggest that BCT could be used. In fact, this is unfortunately what we see in our practice. Patients who have attempted BCT after a known diagnosis of inflammatory breast cancer come back to our institution, now they have chest wall involvement, extension to the other breast, and so what do you do now? This could have been, you know, probably appropriately dealt with at the beginning with a mastectomy, but now you have a patient without metastatic disease who you have to do a heroic resection to get negative margins, and really was this necessary? So I'm going to conclude there is not clear data to support breast conserving therapy in IBC and may actually be detrimental to, to perform it. Now, why are we trying to de-escalate again? Because I'm curious, do we even have really great local regional control? And if you look at the published studies of local regional control in inflammatory breast cancer, the local regional recurrence rates have hovered around 20%. And if you go back and dig through many of those studies, the positive margin rates were 20% or higher. So are we really ready to de-escalate? And so we actually took a different way of looking at this and said, what if we really try to get the margins negative and use aggressive, you know, kind of clearing of the margins and PMRT? What, what will happen then? So we took a group of patients, 115 patients who received a more contemporary trimodal therapy, all completed trimodal therapy. The median follow-up was three and a half years. Now, what's interesting is almost all of these patients, 98% had clear margins, and we only had four local regional recurrences at a rate of three and a half percent and the overall survival was almost 70%. So interestingly, again, not long follow-up, but contemporary trimodal therapy with resection to negative margins is giving us local regional recurrence control equivalent to non-IBC. So of course the, the, the criticism was that wasn't very long follow-up, it wasn't a whole lot of patients. So we actually increased, almost doubled the number of patients, extended the follow-up to five, over five years, and found very similar results. The five-year probability of a local regional relapse was 6.5% when you resected to negative margins, and this occurred in 99% of these cases. 
and the five-year overall survival was 70 percent. So the conclusion here was that at a median five years follow-up, the local regional recurrence rates, when you resect to negative margins and you complete trimodal therapy, is not different from non-IBC significantly, and the survival rate appears to be better. So I would conclude that maybe it's important that we think about how do we get negative margins, not about de-escalating in this situation. And so I want to just, I don't want to sit here and pontificate about negative margins, but not at least offer some how did we kind of do it, but this is the idea. You take the photos pre-treatment and you get a delineation of how much redness there was. You try to design your excision template around that area of redness. Can you remove all of that? And if not, you get your plastic surgery team involved to help you close the defect and obviously not do any skin sparing, nipple sparing, or breast conserving therapy. And so the other important thing I want to point out is all of our patients get preoperative MRI, and we can really then help delineate not only the extent of skin involvement, as you see here, we can see when there's chest wall involvement, as you see right, right here, which alerts us that we need to potentially remove some of the pectoralis muscle to get negative margins. Again, negative margins seems to be important. And then you can also see sometimes even um, extension of nodal disease to the opposite side, which we will resect and remove um, at the same time. So this is my thought, is when you see the patient in clinic, you look here and you say, there's no way we're going to get this closed with uh, primary closure. We need to call plastic surgery. And we call plastic surgery, and I'm sorry for the graphic nature, but I think it's the only way to really kind of explain how we do this, is we delineate or mark out the areas that were red, we draw a template that would excise all that, we make the superior flap, and then we remove the breast from off of the pectoralis muscle, making sure if there's any involvement that that gets removed as well, and then you pull the flap down and see how much can we take and get this closed, uh, get this removed and still possibly get it closed. And you'd say, that's a big defect, but when the plastic surgeons come in and do what's called uh, a reverse abdominal lift, where they uh, dissect underneath the abdominal tissue down all the way sometimes to the symphysis and pull up, you get the wound closed. You, we only had to use flaps in less than 5%. So that's how we got the margins clear. I also want to point out that doing surgery is not going to be without, unfortunately, morbidity. And we found that um, in this report from our group last year, the incidence of lymphedema is 50%, not optimal at all. So now what we're doing is since we have the plastic surgeons there to help us close the defect, we're also performing lymphovenous bypass on these patients to see if we can gather data and really prove that this is, is reducing the incidence of lymphedema. And I will say that at the interim or early analysis, it showed a reduction. So I'm hoping that that will be completed soon and we can actually report on that more definitively. Okay, what about sentinel node mapping? People say, well, it works great for non-IBC. Why can't we try it in IBC? Well, here's a few studies looking at that. Um, so Stearns tried to use it in IBC and found the identification rate was about 75%. And we all know it, for non-IBC, we should all be well above 90%, right? So 75% is suboptimal. Hadar was 80%. Uh, Karanlik was 68%. And in each of these cases, the false negative rate was high, a median of around 20%, which I would say is not, uh, not really acceptable for... for for a false negative rate. So it seemed a prospective study was needed, right? All these retrospective studies. Well, we tried that and it didn't work. We tried a planned study for 100 consecutive IBC patients. We were gonna use dual tracers and see could we map the axilla. What happened is that when you inject the blue dye or the tracer, it wasn't migrating to the axilla. And these are kind of, I think, representative photos where you see what it does, it nicely delineates the, the dilated dermal lymphatics and gives you this nice reticular pattern, but it never really drains properly to the axilla. And that happened over and over and over in these cases, which were true IBC. Um, and so we realized at that point we needed to shut this down and stop. And so there were three, there were four patients who successfully mapped, but all of those had a path CR in the axilla. So I would say there's a glimmer of hope for the future because the Mayo uh, group also looked at PATH-CR in the axilla and found the cumulative axillary uh, PATH-CR rate was about 35% in IBC. So in the future, maybe we can identify patients that could have mapping successfully. But I would say now, with a low identification rate and a high false negative rate, it's simply not appropriate. Yet, when we look at the use in the... In the um, out in, in, in practice, 
we see a statistically, statistically significant increase in use of Sentinel node from 2012 to 2017. So despite the fact that it doesn't appear to work, that there's high false negative rates, low identification rate, it's being used more and more. That is clear. So we would submit that the proper treatment should still be a complete axillary dissection, levels one and two. Um, sometimes level three nodes are seen by our ultrasonographers and their biopsied. If those are positive, we would remove the level three nodes as well. Or if we're in the operating room and we palpate suspicious nodes in level three, we would remove those. But there's simply no data to support that it's safe or accurate to perform sentinel node in inflammatory breast cancer at this time. Yet you saw the data, it is increasing in, in use. And finally, what about immediate reconstruction in, in inflammatory breast cancer? Well, so we see patients from time to time who have immediate reconstruction, and we all understand the rationale. We want to do what's best for the patients. We want to get them back to whole as quickly as possible, but is it really safe to do that? So here's, a, again, an NCDB study that looked at 6,500 patients, um, of which uh, about 10% had immediate breast reconstruction. Now, one of the kind of constraints for these studies, these NCDB studies, is that local regional recurrences were not, are not reportable. So we don't know what the local regional recurrence was. Um, also, they found improved survival in the group that got immediate breast reconstruction. So that is obviously going to select, uh, support the idea there was selection bias. So I think it's very difficult to make kind of strong conclusions from this, but they also noted that immediate breast reconstruction is increasing from 6.5 to 10% at a 4% average annual growth in the inflammatory breast cancer population, even though we don't have clear data. And when we go ahead further and look at um, you know, this, patient, this study from, from Cleveland Clinic, 60 patients with IBC, 16 of them had immediate reconstruction. Now, there were no differences in the local regional uh, relapse rates in this small group of patients, but the patients who had immediate reconstruction had a statistically significantly increased risk of postoperative complications compared to those that did not, with an average or median, I should say, time delay of 10 days more to get to PMRT. So I think, again, yes, there are situations where you probably could get away with it, but do we really want to take the risk of inducing additional complications in a deadly disease and delaying treatment that we know is effective? I would suggest no. And so, you know, this is one other of these kind of, I think, studies that really um, kind of puts the point home about what if we try to de-escalate, maybe do lesser surgery, will it really cause trouble? And I think, um, even though it's not overtly defined here, we can, I think, kind of assume that this is what happened. We had 240 stage three IBC patients from the Dana-Farber who were diagnosed between 97 and 2016, and um, 13 patients had immediate breast reconstruction. Now, I want to tell you, I, this, is, this is the important part of this because the Dana-Farber folks would just kill me, but these were all done outside. So among the 13 patients who had immediate reconstruction, 12 got their surgical care elsewhere, but came to DFCI for Dana-Farber for a second opinion due to recurrence. 12 of the 13 patients in the immediate reconstruction group, that's right, it's not a typo, 12 of 13, 92% had a local regional recurrence and or distant event with one get, having, a, having uh, unfortunately a local regional recurrence and distant metastasis concurrently. So again, when you try to necessarily, let's say, not do the same extent of resection and put in TEs and maybe, you know, affect your radiation fields, it looks like it doesn't really help the patient. So I think this is kind of a warning sign. Also, by the way, in that study, six of the 12 occurrences were within the first year after the treatment. So clearly, it's, it seems like there's residual disease left and it's, it's coming back. So for conclusions about immediate breast reconstruction, I'm going to say I don't believe there's clear data to show the safety of immediate reconstruction. It has been shown already in one published study to induce treatment delays, and in another study showed extremely high recurrence rates. So potentially when you do less surgery or less you know, aggressive resection and you leave disease behind, it's just asking for trouble. We also don't offer, because this question comes up a lot, what do we do with the contralateral breast, we don't offer synchronous prophylactic mastectomy simply because we're just going to increase the rate of complications. We know that. And so what we can do is if it's, a, you know, BRCA or the patient really desires it, symmetry of reconstruction, that can be done later at the time of the reconstruction, but not up front.
So finally, what about stage four disease? So <clears throat> this is difficult because with the recent ECOG 2108 data, I think you know the mantra in the surgical community around the country is um, patients with stage four disease are not often good candidates for resection of the primary tumor. And there's all kinds of things you could talk about with 2108, like maybe there wasn't an adequate representation of patients with oligometastatic disease and maybe they could benefit and things like that, but the real big overall picture is that patient, uh, I should say, surgeons are not eager to operate on um, patients with stage four disease that have non-IBC. One of the problems is with IBC, those patients weren't represented in ECOG 2108. How do we know that they have the same situation as non-IBC? Also, there is no good perspective data. We have no perspective randomized studies, and it's unlikely one will ever happen due to the rarity of the disease. So what do we do about that? So this was a study, again, um, retrospective in nature, looking at 97 patients with um, de novo stage four IBC from 2007 to 2016. All received neoadjuvant therapy, and um, half of them uh, underwent mastectomy, and about half got PMRT. And what we found was that the median overall survival when you have a mastectomy is um, 58 months versus 19 months when there's no removal of the primary tumor. So of course, selection bias, right? We'd say selection bias, but that's a pretty profound difference. And you know, when we looked at the multivariate analysis, having a mastectomy was significantly associated with overall survival. And so rather than say, well, that's a single institutional one-off study, right about the time that came out, a study came out of the Netherlands saying better survival after surgery for the primary tumor in stage four inflammatory breast cancer. And what they found was very similar. You look at the Kaplan-Meyers, they're not too, too different. And they found after propensity score matching, Modified radical mastectomy is still associated with superior uh, survival and in a multivariate analysis remained an independent factor for outcome. And so I think one of the problems we have is that we don't have good perspective data and these patients weren't in 2108. So what do we do on Monday when we go back? I think you know, retrospective studies have shown significantly improved survival. We don't know if there's selection bias, but, but we don't have perspective data. And due to the differences being so profound in the outcomes, we do offer uh, removal of the primary to our stage four patients who have good response to neoadjuvant therapy. I will also say we're doing some kind of you know, correlative science behind the scenes to say that it is potentially very different microenvironment to have an, an inflammatory breast cancer left in place versus a non-inflammatory, and I'm hoping we'll have more information about that in the future. So in conclusion, I would say that modified radical mastectomy, including removal of the axillary lymph nodes and resecting the tumor to negative margins, of course followed by post-mastectomy radiation therapy, produces local control. You can get similar to non-IBC. And it's important to get the plastic surgeons available up front and involved to not only help get the margins clear, but to, uh, for, for, for potentially lymphedema surgery as well. Survival outcomes appear to be improving. Remember, we started at 50%, and now we're talking about 70% with completion of contemporary trimodal therapy. Obviously, better systemic therapies contribute to that as well. But we can improve the outcome of patients with IBC if we just follow the current treatment guidelines. Because I would say that in conclusion, after reviewing this data, there's no clear data to support de-escalation of surgical therapy for inflammatory breast cancer at this time. So with that being said, I want to thank you and thank the uh, organizers for inviting us to talk about this. Thanks so much. Thank you, Dr. Lucci. That was a fantastic review, so much data. And I would like to invite Dr. Bellen, my colleague from Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and Brigham uh, Women's Hospital, to talk to us about some controversies in radiation therapy in inflammatory breast cancer. Thank you so much. Uh, and you don't have to have curly hair um, to talk about inflammatory breast cancer. <laughs> no relevant disclosures. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about how local therapy and radiation is different in IBC, a little bit about appropriate dose and fractionation, um, local therapy in stage four disease, and then on ongoing efforts to improve outcomes. So I think as, as others have mentioned, multidisciplinary care and communication is 
is key for all of our patients, but is exceptionally important here. We really need to know the full extent of the clinical presentation, and that needs to be documented uh, ideally with photographs um, with both sides for comparison, and that's particularly helpful in women of color. And optimally, all docs involved in the care of the patient should see the patient shortly after the initial diagnosis. Accurate staging is vital and actually can change the radiation dose and fields. And PET can be particularly helpful. This is a study from one of my colleagues, Heather Jacin, looking at 81 patients with inflammatory breast cancer. All had contrast-enhanced CT and FDG PET at diagnosis. And these studies were independently reviewed by a nuclear medicine specialist and a cancer imaging diagnostic radiologist, both blinded to the clinical situation. They classified the studies as concordant or discordant and defined discordant as the presence or absence of distant disease, findings that would impact radiation, or incidental findings unrelated to the breast cancer. And what they found was out of a total of 81 patients, about half of them had discordant findings, 41 patients. That was most commonly related to the presence of distant disease that was unsuspected on CAT scan, but was seen on PET. Um, incidental findings were unlikely, and findings related to changes in radiation were more common, about 30%. If we take a deeper dive into that, you can see that this would change the radiation dose in 10 patients or the radiation field in four patients. And we have a similar study from Dr. Walker et al., 62 patients that looked at the additional benefit of PET imaging and found new areas of disease in 27 of 62 patients. And you can see that that was in the regional nodes as well as distant sites, and that this changed the radiation fields in seven patients and changed the dose in seven patients. And I should add that typically for non-radiation oncologists, the the dose is increased to give additional dose to, not, to local regional sites that are not operated on. So that's typically, but, but, but presented with gross disease. So that's typically the internal mammary lymph nodes or the supraclavicular lymph nodes. And as Dr. Lucy so nicely pointed out, that best results have been shown with tri trimodality therapy. So we don't have direct data looking at, from randomized trials, looking at the benefit of postmastectomy radiation for women with inflammatory disease. But we do have a considerable amount of inferential data. And this is a nice study from the NCDB, over 10,000 patients with non-metastatic inflammatory disease. And you can see that patients who underwent surgery alone in the gray curve did worse than patients who received trimodality therapy. Now, of course, there, there's potential bias in why patients would not go on to surgery based on extensive disease or response to treatment, but I still think this is probably the best data we have supporting trimodality therapy. When you're thinking about radiation planning, uh, you want to make sure that you include the entire previous extent of involved skin and lymph nodes. And as previously mentioned, photographs can be, uh, are very helpful. Pro photographs before any chemotherapy is initiated. Um, and this is typically comprehensive chest wall and nodal radiation, including the internal mammary nodes, supraclavicular, infraclavicular, and axillary lymph nodes, and the entire chest wall with bolus. Um, for non-radiation oncologists, if they're radiation oncologists, please forgive me for just a minute. Bolus is a plastic uh, covering that we put on the chest wall. And the point of it is that typically there's a few millimeters before the dose builds up to its full strength. A and that's a little bit variable depending on the energy of the radiation, the size of the field, and the angle of incident that the radiation hits the skin. But by adding this plastic to the chest, you can get full dose uh, directly at the chest wall, which is particularly important in a disease that uh, typically involves the skin. 
Now, if you look back to older studies with uh, radiation therapy and trimodality treatment, results aren't great. Anywhere from 15 to 22 percent local regional recurrence, uh, and generally not with a particularly long follow-up. Now, I think MD Anderson has led the way with looking at how can we do better by changing dose and fractionation. So this is a retrospective review from MD Anderson, 256 patients with non-metastatic disease going all the way back to 1977. They looked at two cohorts, a pre-1981, where the patients received a, a fairly standard 50 gray and 25 fractions, so two gray per fraction with a 10 gray boost to the chest wall, and then a post-1981 where patients were treated with a BID fashion twice daily with a dose escalation uh, with the, including a f uh, to 51 gray, but then a 15 gray boost. So giving twice daily radiation allowed them to go to a higher dose. And what they found is improved local recurrence at five years in patients who had a path CR, not surprisingly, negative margins, fewer lymph nodes involved. Overall, they did not find that radiation schedule and dose impacted local regional recurrence, but on subgroup analysis, they did find a benefit to BID radiation with dose escalation in patients who did not have a complete response, those with closer positive margins, patient, young, and younger patients less than 45. So they did a really nice follow-up study looking at tailored fractionation. So can we use that paradigm of identifying patients more likely to benefit from dose escalation, BID radiation, and uh, but spare um, lower risk patients and give them more conventional daily radiation. So again, retrospective review, 103 patients, two groups, one with daily radiation and one with twice daily radiation. The bolus was fairly aggressive in both groups, and you can see it there in the BID, every day for five days, I'm sorry, every treatment for five days, then once daily, then as needed. And then the daily fractionation was every other day and then as needed. And what they found was that there were low uh, local rates of local regional recurrence in both groups of patients. Now, of course, these patients are not randomized for the question of fractionation. Um, this is just applying um, their paradigm and showing that very good and low rates of local regional recurrence were achieved in both arms. I think it is um, important to mention, though, that this was not without toxicity. They had five patients in the twice daily arm that had symptomatic pneumonitis, 8%, and two patients with brachioplexopathy. Now, other groups have also tried to look at whether the BID radiation is, is necessary. And this is a retrospective review from the Mayo Clinic, uh, 52 patients all had mastectomy and adjuvant radiation, and they uh, more aggressively added the bolus. So the bolus was daily throughout the treatment, but they used once daily fractionation. And they found um, pretty good results, 81% local regional control at five years, so a little longer than in the older studies. Um, but um, in the fine print, patients who received an additional boost actually had no rates of local regional recurrence. So how you get there is not completely clear, whether a twice daily regimen, aggressive bolus, but in any case, this is, this is not a group that we should apply Dr. Mamounis's you know, amazing data from this morning looking at omitting radiation in patients who achieve a complete response in the nodes. This is a group where uh, I think, in my opinion, that aggressive treatment is still warranted. Okay, um, I'd, I'd like to say a little bit about um, local therapy in stage four disease. Um, and, you know, we know that there is no clear benefit in the non-IBC setting, and this is Dr. Khan's econ Akron data showing not only no um, difference in overall survival when patients undergo surgery or not in the setting of stage four disease, and actually, interestingly, also no significant difference in quality of life. I think we 
Think about this, though, in patients with inflammatory breast cancer due to higher rates of local regional recurrence and, and, and also because of the morbidity of local regional um, recurrence. This is some data from um, Laura Warren and our group showing about a 40% risk of uh, local recurrence or progression at three years in patients with stage uh, four disease. And then when we took patients who did or did not have local therapy, um, there was a marked difference um, in the, the chance of local regional recurrence or progression. Most of the time that was surgery and radiation, but a few patients received surgery alone or radiation alone. And there was a 48 versus 18% difference in the risk of local regional um, recurrence or progression. Now again, just as Dr. Lucci pointed out, there is almost certainly bias here in that patients who are doing better are more likely to undergo local therapy. Um, this is a multi-center study from China, again looking at the same question, can uh, local therapy impact overall outcome despite metastatic disease? So they looked at um, 75 patients I'm sorry, they looked at 156 patients, 75 of whom had local regional therapy, which was radiation with or without surgery, and they found uh, a difference in um, overall survival at two years, 32% versus 52% in patients receiving local therapy. And this actually was an independent prognostic factor for overall survival. When you look at the curves, you can see that um, that local therapy uh, improved overall survival um, relative to um, no local therapy. Uh, and then when you break it down in the, cur in the uh, graph on the right, you can again see that surgery with radiation, the top curve in blue, looked better than no therapy. Again, almost certainly bias in patient selection. Um, this is uh, some data from MD Anderson. Um, showing improvements in overall survival in patients who undergo surgery versus no surgery. And then when you uh, take a little bit of a deeper dive into um, the exact local therapy, you can see that it seems that surgery and radiation therapy together in yellow do better than patients who uh, undergo no local therapy or less aggressive local therapy. I think it's important to keep in mind the morbidity of local treatment, though. And this is, this is um, a SEER analysis in patients with metastatic disease, T4 metastatic disease, but non-inflammatory, uh, just looking at the morbidity of local treatment. And you can see it on the right that of the uh, total population of 3,600 patients, about 43% underwent local therapy, and this was a combination of surgery, radiation, or both. And you can see that while the, the, the morbidity is not overwhelming, it is significantly increased across multiple domains in the patients undergoing um, local therapy. So it's, it's not something to be taken lightly. Um, just as an aside, I think there are subsets of patients that may have uh, may particularly be uh, appropriate for consideration of local therapy. Um, this was a nice study by Dr. Greedo Castro from our group looking at patients with HER2 positive disease who have particularly favorable outcomes. Um, the writing got a little small for me, um, but you can see the uh, overall survival and progression-free survival in patients um, with metastatic disease who receive standard of care um, uh, anti-HER2 therapy. And then when you look at local regional progression or recurrence by receipt of surgery, and 80% of those patients also received postmastectomy radiation, on the right you can see that there were no local recurrences in this group with uh, anti-HER2 therapy that also underwent uh, local local therapy. So a suggestion that maybe these patients who are benefiting from improvements in systemic therapy and particularly in very responsive systemic therapy um, may be a select group that benefits from um, more aggressive local regional therapy despite having metastatic disease. <clears throat> 
And finally, just one slide on patients who present with uh, a limited axillary presentation. Um, and this is actually not as uncommon as I would have thought. Um, in a large series of patients with inflammatory disease, about 8% of them had a synchronous contralateral axillary uh, nodal metastasis. Um, most of these were most of these patients also had concurrent distant disease, but not all. Um, and they managed them quite aggressively. 22 patients had contralateral, as Dr. Lucci had met, has, has discussed, 22 patients had contralateral axillary surgery, and 18 also received um, adjuvant contralateral nodal radiation. And what they found was that stage four patients with isolated contralateral axillary metastasis had actually had similar survival to stage uh, three patients. So because of the um, extensive um, lymphatic involvement in patients with inflammatory disease, this is potential, you can hypothesize that this should be thought of more as a um, extent of local regional treat, uh, uh, disease rather than a true distant metastatic site. Although technically by the staging system, of course it is metastatic. And potentially, this is a group where we should consider more aggressive local therapy. Um, so while, while we don't have randomized data, which is the best way to really understand the benefit of surgery and radiation in patients with stage four disease, I would like to just spend a minute highlighting a prospective registry led by Faina Naklas. And what she's doing is taking patients with stage four uh, disease who do not have distant disease progression on induction chemotherapy. And then it, it's not randomized. Patients and physicians decide together on the disease course, but the patients will be followed um, with close attention to quality of life. And this is just an idea of the quality of life monitoring. So they'll do lymphedema self-assessments, skin toxicity, decision regret assessments um, as the primary objective of the study. And then as a secondary objective, we'll learn more about local regional progression-free survival, distant disease, and overall survival. So not randomized, um, but hopefully will give us very important information about the quality of life trade-offs. Okay, so in the last few minutes, I just wanted to say a few words about radio sensitization, and I'd like to highlight some of the work from the University of Michigan. Um, this is some of the background data that led to their uh, PARP inhibitor trials concurrent with radiation, and this shows that across multiple sub uh, cell lines, including patients with inflammatory disease, or I'm sorry, including um, inflammatory cell lines across subtypes, and both with and without BRCA mutations, there is a differential sensitization of um, cells um, with the PARP inhibitor with, uh, uh, compared to um, sensitization of normal tissue. That led to the TBCRC24, which was a multi-institutional phase one study looking at concurrent viliparib with radiation therapy. The radiation was conventional 50 gray and 25 fractions and a 10 gray boost. Um, they did find that there were five dose-limiting toxicities, four dose-limiting moist desquamation, one dose-limiting neutropenia, and with follow-up, six of 15 patients had severe fibrosis. So, they determined that this was feasible, and this led to a phase two multicenter randomized trial that's now an intergroup study looking at the PARP inhibitor olaparib concurrently with radiation therapy. And you can see the two arms here, arm one, radiation with olaparib, arm two, radiation alone. Um, the patients are stratified by biologic subtype, residual status, uh, with disease or without disease after preoperative therapy, and the primary endpoint is invasive disease-free survival. 
Uh, there is an, uh, uh, just to give a shout out to the study, there is an amendment that is just about to be approved allowing BID radiation in the control arm. I think there's some concern about toxicity of BID radiation with the olaparib. And the study is marching along with 140 accrued patients. But it's certainly um, really nice to have this as an option to offer to our patients to help um, improve um, um, local control, hopefully, and, and, uh, and help them improve outcomes. So I think this remains a challenging disease with elevated rates of both local and distant recurrence. Without a prospective randomized trial, it's hard to convincingly know that BID radiation is superior to aggressive daily radiation. My bias, and this is not uh, uh, data-driven, is that the greatest gains in local therapy, though, will come from improvements in systemic therapy. Surgery and radiation for stage four likely lowers local regional recurrence. Whether that definitively impacts overall survival is, is still, in my mind, in question due to sele selection bias and patient um, uh, selection in the retrospective studies. And I'm excited to learn more about quality of life and the trade-offs of recurrence and side effects um, with Dr. Nachlis's registry. So I'll, I'll stop there and thank you. Thank you very much. Now I would like to invite Naomi John, Jeannie Mason, and Terry Arnold to join us here for the panel discussion. Three wonderful IBC patient advocates. And I, I would like to start just by asking each of you to introduce yourselves as you are familiar to many of us in the audience. Hopefully the microphones are on. Yes, good. Good start. Uh, so my name is Naomi John. I'm a uh, stage three IBC patient. Um, I was diagnosed in February 2020, three weeks before the UK went into COVID lockdown. So that was fun. Um, but I'm doing well, and I'm now the Vice Chair of the Inflammatory Breast Cancer Network in the UK. I'm Terry Arnold, and I live in Houston, Texas, and I was diagnosed with IBC 13, 16 years ago, and I run the IBC Network US. Technology, not your friend. My name is Jenny Mason. I'm uh, with the Inflammatory Breast Cancer Research Foundation, and I was diagnosed in 1994, so I'm 28, no, 29 years from diagnosis. So we, we have already a lot of questions online and from the audience. But first, I, I just had very brief questions for each of our, very brief question for each of our advocates. And I'll start by you, Naomi. What is the role of an IBC patient advocate? So I actually consulted my colleagues and members of the UK network about what the role of an, of an IBC patient advocate is, um, because this is not something that I could personally answer just within my own capacity. So I've got some notes. I'm not going to read them word for word, but my neurons don't fire as they used to before all of the chemo. Um, first of all, on behalf of the IBC network in the UK, I'd like to thank the organizers um, for the invitation to attend this important panel um, and to share this platform. It's a real privilege, so thank you very much. Um, as I mentioned, I'm very passionate about inflammatory breast cancer. I obviously have a vested interest in this subset of disease, but my professional background is clinical research. I personally don't find the cancer lang battle language very helpful, um, but when you're literally on the floor after your diagnosis, a prognosis, treatment, surgery, and when you're dealing with the side effects of a medical menopause, you need to have 
that support behind you. Um, our patients need our support to help them ask the right questions, to push for the right treatment at the right time. And until we have a global protocol in place that is universally accepted for the trimodal treatment, that's where our advocacy comes in to make sure that they can receive the best possible care. Thank you. Terry, in your perspective, uh, what are the most important unmet needs in IBC right now? Thank you for the question. I have my notes here in front of me, and there's five little points I want to hit on quickly, and they're very bullet point. But when you ask what are the lacks uh, for inflammatory breast cancer, it's almost like where to start. If you saw the earlier presentations, we hear a lot of we don't know or we don't have. But hope lives in this research, so I'm not discouraged by that. But if you heard the presentations, you can see how different inflammatory is. And so we have to find a way to bridge that gap of this very different disease from off the knowledge we already know. So I want to talk about medical, treatment, research, and long term. So under the medical, we need to increase our education. If you're a young woman whose breast is swollen and you've just had a baby and you're nursing, you're probably not going to go to a breast surgeon. You're going to go to your OBGYN or you're going to go to your pediatrician. They're not necessarily trained. Or if you have a rash, you might go to the dermatologist. We need to expand that knowledge base to other medical expertise. And also when we know these are younger women being diagnosed who aren't thinking breast cancer because they've heard a lot mammogram early detection, none of that applies to us. So we have to broaden the base, not only medically, but also into the community. So we can have tools to be good advocates for ourselves. And we hear a lot about de-escalation. I really appreciate Dr. Lucci especially saying this, because this is not the place to de-escalate. And because, again, it is so different. We need a national standard of care. So then not everybody has the ability or desire to go to a specialty center, and they're so limited. So if we can have that national standard of care, coupled with greater education, we can fill that gap. Now, on the treatment level, when, again, you hear 40% got the wrong care or not the appropriate care. And that's just the ones we know. We don't have a medical encoding number. Now there's a new tracking system that Ginny was a part of helping develop uh, with Komen for some coding to help make better diagnosis. But that may be not necessarily all we need for tracking. So hopefully that conversation can then expand with this new scoring. But again, I'm gonna keep saying it, I wanna code. Specialty clinics aren't always available to people. And we need second opinions. And we need to be able to consult with specialists and then bring that knowledge back into our community. If we can lobby insurance companies to understand IBC is different, and we may need more CTCs or second opinions or care or access to clinical trials or clinical trials that don't preclude us, again, it's another gap. So those are some things we want to do. Research-wise, oh, man, that's what gets me excited. That's why I wanted to start the IBC network to fund research is my way of paying it forward and I saw the huge gap. I assumed you guys got a big bucket of money and were just told here spend it. I didn't know how hard you had to fight to get a grant to fund something so that's why we created the IBC network. I didn't know. Now I want to see more cell lines, I want to see those PDXs, those humanized mouse models, the biomarkers, all these things that I see these researchers get so excited talking about that they don't have. And research can have that. I want rare to be given a chance to be cured through those research models. I want to lobby the DOD and all of the other funders to throw out a small portion to the rare. Because the, if you can cure something rare that's aggressive, maybe we can apply that to other diseases as well. And now on long term, as someone who's lived with significant lymphedema, please don't get me wrong, I am grateful for my life but I'm one of the ones who presented, again, there's a gap. And I'm seeing that gap get better where we're being screened. But we have long-term side effects to be quite dis disabling, and we need to deal with that. And the collateral damage of such an aggressive disease can be quite difficult, not only on us, but our families. We need better long-term care. So I wanna wrap it up with I'm very grateful and I'm very thankful to be here, to be anywhere after what I was given my diagnosis to be. I see great progress, and I'm so excited that the San Antonio Conference picked this year to present IBC from the main stage for the first time, and I lived to see it. So thank you, Hope Always. <laughs>
Thank you, Terry and Jeannie. And this was a question suggested by Dr. Bella. Uh, based on your experience, and I'm sure so many patients that you encounter in your journey, how can we healthcare providers do better for patients with inflammatory breast cancer? Okay, how long do we have? <laughs> <laughs> Two to three minutes. Oh my, there's just a lot has been said already about what we can do to do better. Uh, it's a huge issue. I've done it, given the last 25 years of my life to doing this. Uh, my organization will be 25 next year. And because I've been given the gift of these extra years, I want to see so many of the changes you've already heard about that we'd like to see. Um, we, we need to empower people to advocate for themselves, and we need the medical community to listen to us. We're, we're experts in us, uh, but it's really challenging. Um, I think people hear rare, and they don't think they'll ever see it. And consequently, it took me almost five months to get a diagnosis, and I'm just amazed that I did not have uh, metastatic disease by that point. But we're doing all these different things, like the diagnosis code to help someone, uh, or diagnostic system, to help people get into treatment faster. Maybe we can improve outcomes by doing things like that. Um, educating as much of the medical community as we can. Because a lot of people just have never even heard of inflammatory breast cancer or aren't aware it is its own separate thing. It's not just breast cancer. There's just so many places that we can make a difference, and it's why we advocates put our lives into this. We don't get paid. Um, gave up a good nursing job to be able to do this full time. And can't fire me, I'm a volunteer. <laughs> But I think uh, the opportunity like this, I'm so grateful to all of you who voted for an inflammatory breast cancer session. We were cheering when we learned that we received this opportunity because we have waited so long to be a part of the program in a more visible way instead of meeting in the evening somewhere to talk about the disease. So I think it's, it takes all of us you know, as they say, it takes a village to make a difference, and I'm so grateful for all the people who have joined our village to help patients get the appropriate treatment, diagnosis, and for all of us working to see that survival continues to improve. I was told I had a 3% chance of being alive in five years back in 1994, and I'm still here. So I'm hoping to see a lot more of them. Thank you, Jeannie. So I would now start with a, a, a question from the microphone that it's on my right, and then we'll alternate to the other side. Thank you. Juan Santa Maria, surgical oncologist in Nebraska, University of uh, Nebraska. My question for Dr. Lucy Lucci, as we uh, agree we should not de-escalate in this disease, and we are headed to de-escalate in axillary surgery and other breast cancers. What is your opinion on immediate lymphatic reconstruction and the prevention of lymphedema at the time of this operation? Is that the practice at MD Anderson? Is it going to be incorporated, do you think, in light of his, perhaps some experiences in randomizing patients to undergo immediate lymphatic reconstruction? And two, what is your standard protocol to do breast reconstruction after uh, what is the timeline that you recommend we can start considering the patients that are not going to recur locally and that we can offer them breast reconstruction? Thank you. Uh, is this working? Yes. Okay. So those are good questions. Um, for lymphedema surgery, we are doing um, as often as, as, as whenever possible. We're trying to do it at the time of the axillary dissection, and we're doing reverse mapping, so we'll inject the blue dye, identify blue lymphatics coming up from the arm and then preserve as much length as we can of the vein 
to help make it easier on the plastic surgeons to put that together. And they'll do, the, the question really is how many do you have to do? I don't think that's really decided yet, but in the interim data that we have so far, and there's a published paper from Memorial showing similar, um, there has been a reduction in the incidence of lymphedema. So I'm hoping once we perfect and you know, refine that technique, we can reduce it even, even further. Um, so we are doing it up front and collecting the data. As far as reconstruction, you know, we prefer to wait until after the radiation effects are gone, and sometimes that can be eight to 12 months. And even though that's a difficult time to be without a reconstructed breast, we've just found that that gives us the best local, regional um, control. And also, our plastic surgeons feel that gives us the best cosmesis because they don't really like to have reconstructed uh, mound and then skin irradiated with bolus, and then it just doesn't look as, as uh, they don't think as good in the, long, in the final outcome. So that's what we're doing. Thank you. The microphone on my left. Yes, thank you. Dr. Doug Anderson, I'm a community oncologist in Idaho. Uh, I had one comment and then one question for surgery. Uh, the comment was just, you know, with... Immunotherapy, we know that the microenvironment has a lot to do with the efficacy of it, in addition to molecular and other, and other factors, but I haven't seen any trials trying to target inflammatory breast cancer with immunotherapy. Uh, is that, I haven't seen any publications. Does anybody know of that trial being done? Yeah, so I, I can answer that one. I, I didn't, I'm a medical oncologist as well. There are currently two ongoing clinical trials with immunotherapy dedicated to patients with inflammatory breast cancer. One of them is the TRUDY study that is currently open at Dana-Farber and MD Anderson. Includes two cohorts of patients, one with HER2 positive and the other with HER2 low disease, and offers uh, trastuzumab deroxtican, so an antibody drug conjugate, with durvalumab, a checkpoint inhibitor for all patients in the new adjuvant setting. There's another study, the NeoStar, that recently opened an arm exclusively dedicated to patients with IBC where patients get another antibody drug conjugate, so saxituzumab, govitecan, with pembrolizumab prior to AC. So I think that we'll get some important data uh, uh, from those two studies. There is a study that recently completed accrual in France, the Pelican study, where immunotherapy was added pembrolizumab to standard new adjuvant chemotherapy. Uh, one of those cohorts reported uh, yesterday. Uh, there is a poster as well on those results, along with some world real data, and uh, real world data, and uh, I know that they'll be publishing the results soon. So, Excellent. off Let's note, get to and you. it's a small sample size, but the PCR rate reported with the keynote regimens uh, reported yesterday is half of what you have seen in the clinical trial. So uh, I would say so that okay. there is a role, but we need to continue to find how to do better and get higher PCR rates. Thank you. The other question was just for surgery. Um, so in, you were saying for stage four patients that you do mastectomy or local regional control after neoadjuvant therapy. Are you talking about, uh, pardon, but uh, like a toilet mastectomy, like if you aren't able to get a full, full disease control, or are you talking about just a patient that you're able to render them NED, like they have liver mets, brain mets, bone mets, you know? Yeah, so that, that's a good question. We're trying to, obviously we are not going to do the operation if we have to cut through tumor. The whole point is we want to get negative margins and establish local control, so we would prefer to if we're going to do that, it has to be a patient who's had good response to neoadjuvant therapy and control of the distant disease. And if that appears to be the case and we can remove the primary to negative margins, then we would offer that. And I think the, hopefully they'll, you know, it, the, the microenvironment, as you know, we had a really excellent discussion about that, is so, it appears to be so different. I think when we remove the primary, there may be a benefit that goes beyond, you know, just removing the local disease. We'll see about that. But that's one hypothesis. You have this large inflammatory mass that's constantly seeding out inflammatory cytokines, lots of microscopic disease. Who knows, maybe it's different from non-IBC and removing the primary, there's a, a, a different reason why. But we have to obviously look, look into that. But we remove the whole disease to negative margins. Okay. But even if they have unresectable other disease throughout your, or untargetable disease, you know what I'm saying? 
No, I think, I think an important point is you, obviously this is where there's selection bias, is you're going to take patients who have control of the distant disease. You're not really going to offer a local therapy if the patient has out of control distant disease. So we would not do it. Let's say if they have growing liver metastasis, it doesn't make sense. And just, and just to add to that, we'd often drag our feet a little bit and not offer um, <clears throat> local therapy immediately after the initial chemotherapy and um, just ensure that there's a disease, um, a period of stability. Uh, Valerie from IBCIC. Hi, I'm Valerie Fraser. I'm a research advocate with SWOG and the Inflammatory Breast Cancer International Consortium. And I'd like to address a question to Dr. Lucci on your presentation. Um, I know local regional control and trimodality has always been sort of the hallmark for treatment of inflammatory breast cancer and really important. Um, but your slides in your presentation with regard to women that are not having surgery or opting, opting out of surgery, um, I'm just curious if any data has been collected as to reoccurrence rates on those patients as opposed to patients that have had trimodality. Um, I think that data would be important to gather, um, and depending upon subtype, like you said, um, with inflammatory breast cancer and other cancers, there's going to be differences in the immune response um, to the cancer. So I. I'd open it up to the panel, too, but specifically because um, you presented on that. Right. So, so those patients are represented in that data. If you looked at the curves, the bottom um, line is the patients who didn't have the disease removed. So we are following them to see if there's recurrence. So they are actually included on those, on those graphs. So that, that is, they definitely are followed and included. Do you know of any other centers are following patients with regard to that data, besides MD Anderson? Um, are, other, are other institutions following patients who don't undergo surgery to see the recurrence, uh, ultimate recurrence rates? Is that the question? Yeah. yeah. We are. So at Dana Farber, in our database, we follow those patients. Um, so we we follow them serially, both if they have surgery or not, and that will be included in the uh, prospective cohort that was initially start that was recently started. Yeah, on the scheme that, the schema that I showed, that was the top line. The patients who um, all patients will be followed, but the patients who choose not to have um, uh, local therapy as well. I think it would be important too to gather um, data on the immune microenvironment in those patients as well as patients that have had, you know, complete trimodality. It might give us more information and be able to push research forward um, in treatment in this novel and um, very unusual disease. Um, I'm a 17-year survivor of inflammatory breast cancer. Um, and my other question, just quickly, is I'm wondering if anybody on the panel has any um, Anything with regard to, or any information with regard to any novel, more targeted therapeutics for inflammatory breast cancer? Because I think that's sort of at the heart of the treatment. I think a local regional control has always been, um, you know, a, a hallmark. But we, we really should be looking beyond that in systemic treatment. Great question, Valerie. I think that we have seen in SEER database analysis that over the years, the outcomes of IBC have been improving, not as much as we see in non-IBC, but we have seen improvements, and probably that reflects better systemic therapies. So many of us think that probably the best way to make further advances in terms of systemic therapies is bring these very active drugs either to an early stage setting or to make sure that patients are receiving uh, these novel therapies. In terms of targeted therapies, there have been many clinical trials trying this approach. Um, uh, Dr. Howard showed some of them, some that will be reported soon. So I think that while we continue that approach, 
is important to bring the novel systemic therapies to patients with IBC as well. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Valerie. And I think just before the next question, I'm just going to address, there are three online questions, radiation related, so uh, that were voted highly, so I'll just direct them to Dr. Bellin. Uh, hypofractionate comprehensive radiation, as British do, over 15 fractions, is this an option for IBC? How do you design your radiation therapy boost volume when boosting the chest wall? wall? And okay. then the last question, after definitive radiation, if a patient has a local regional recurrence, what is the minimum time that you wait to re-irradiate the same region? Okay, wow. Okay, so um, <laughs> let's start with that one. Um, there's no minimum, there's no formula. Um, when I'm thinking about re-irradiation, um, I'm weighing multiple factors. How long it's been since the, the initial radiation? What area am I re-irradiating? Is this re-irradiating on the chest wall or re-irradiating um, over the brachial plexus? Um, how big is the area of retreatment? And what are the other systemic options? And how is the patient doing overall? So no um, kind of easy answer to that. Um, uh, the first question was, is hypofractionation an option? Um, I, I would say no, that we, we just don't, do not have data to support that. And, and in a situation where we're using bolus fairly aggressively, um, I, I don't think, I, I would be concerned about toxicity, but more importantly, I would be concerned that this is just, that's a, that it would just be outside of what we have data for. And I'm not aware of anyone uh, doing that. And I'm sorry, the second question? How do you design your boost, your radiation boost, okay. when you are treating the chest wall? Okay, so, so typically I would boost areas of nodal disease that have not been operated on that were initially um, suspicious. So that would include the in, in, internal mammary lymph nodes if they were um, radiographically uh, concerning and supraclavicular lymph nodes if they were um, radiographically or clinically concerning. And then any areas that the surgeon is concerned about, I had to um, remove disease off of the axillary vein or, or something like that, then I would consider boosting. So areas of gross disease, and then I would also boost generously around the, um, the mastectomy incision. Thank you. Microphone on my left. Thank you. I'm Dr. Sharon Grunfest from Cleveland Clinic, and I appreciated the uh, presentations today. Uh, I agree that you should have complete resection of disease of, uh, in inflammatory breast cancer, and that's always been my practice. My question is, when you get patients who have neoadjuvant chemotherapy, and then they have essentially a pathologic complete response, it can be very difficult to figure out how much skin to take. And I think we need to work on on imaging techniques to try to somehow sort that out. Maybe MRI might be helpful, I'm not sure. And my second comment is with regard to the lymphovascular bypass, I think we urgently need a trial of delayed lymphovascular bypass versus immediate lymphovascular bypass because these patients have radiation which can cause uh, fibrosis. So to answer the last question first, um, we have done it both ways. We've done immediate versus delayed, and um, our team of plastic surgeons who've collected the data thus far felt that there was actually significant reduction with the immediate procedure, which is a little bit easier. But I, I agree, you, you, can, um, you can do it both ways. And remind me the first question again. So uh, I was wondering if you had any thoughts as to, you know, how much skin to take in patients who show oh. what appears to be a complete response. Right, and I think you meant a co complete clinical response. So even with the yes. complete clinical response, we oftentimes will refer back to the photos we took initially to see where the redness extended to, and we would like to remove that whenever possible. Um, obviously, you don't know if it's a pathologic complete response yet. You have to remove the tissue. So we kind of use our photos to guide the template, 
and try to resect. And believe it or not, we can get the, the, the wound closed most of the time primarily just using the technique we saw. We used flaps in less than 5% of the cases. So I don't think you necessarily have to you know, always revert to No, I, I completely agree with that because that's something we've been doing for a long time. And I, I've got 20-year survivors after inflammatory cancer. But I, I, I always struggle with the question of how much skin to take in patients who have a clinical complete response. Do you have any um, concerns or issues in your institution with women uh, being delayed in starting radiation because of the lymphatic uh, bypass procedures? Good question. We haven't seen any delays at all. In fact, um, they do them at the time we do the axillary dissection, and now they've become so facile that it adds maybe an hour and a half to the procedure, so we have not seen any delays in um, treatment. And one other thing I would point out is that we do intraoperative uh, radiograph of the, of the resected mastectomy specimen, looking at the skin to make sure there's no calx or something strange that we need to take more. So that's just another safeguard to try to make sure the margins are clear. Before next question, just a question to Dr. Howard that came online. How relevant do you think the tissue of origin is compared to a metastatic site in terms of the work you show? Yeah, I think that's a great question in several of these analyses. Obviously, when you're thinking about targeted sequencing, these analyses may be biased towards samples from uh, metastatic settings. Um, and <clears throat> I think uh, thus far, for example, we saw some of, these, some of these analyses have found these mutational pathways are increased in inflammatory breast cancer, like NOTCH and uh, DNA repair. The second, uh, I forget the uh, primary author in that study, but the second one that I had talked about on slides, we saw they adjusted for uh, AJCC stage and so adjusted for um, you know, metastatic stage, and they still found that those alterations were significant in the metastatic site. But I think it's, a, it's important to note that these, a lot of these analyses may be biased, and that may explain another element of heterogeneity in these studies that can lead to the conflicting results we see. Thank you. Microphone on the right. Uh, thank you for a very interesting uh, session. I, my name is Alexander Petrovsky. I'm from Moscow, Russia. Uh, the question is for the whole panel, but uh, I think mostly for Professor Lucci. Uh, if you would consider uh, the tumor non-resectable after standard neoadjuvant therapy, I believe most of them receive uh, anthracycline and taxane-based chemotherapy, what would you consider next? Do you perform extra chemotherapy or you go to definite uh, radiation therapy or you still perform resection? Yeah, that's a really good question, and that happens not infrequently. So if we see that it looks like it's still outside, it's still not resectable, we would, uh, we would uh, recommend additional systemic therapy to try to get a response. We want maximal response and the maximal reduction possible so that then if we resect, we're not going to have distant disease showing up elsewhere as well. So that's, that's a really good question. Um, we're not as big on, on um, pre-op radiation therapy. I mean, I would say it's an option, but for, the most, for most of the cases, we'd prefer to get a, a response with systemic treatment to the point where we could resect to negative margins. Okay. That would be our optimal situation. How many lines of chemotherapy would you perform? Well, honestly, we're not going to recommend going to surgery until we have a response. So there's been cases where the only time that may vary is if you're having an imminent loss of local control, where it looks like it's getting to the point where you could still get it out but if you have any more extension, it's not going to be resectable, and that could cause a local control problem, then we will stop the systemic therapy, remove the primary, and then go to adjuvant therapy. We have had situations like that as well. Thank you. And I'll just say there is a paper that was just accepted, first starter, Dr. Naklis, looking at the uh, combined experience between Dana-Farber and MD Anderson, showing the results of patients, the, the surgical outcomes of patients that required one line versus two to three. So I think that there will be important. Last question on the left. Sure, sorry. Um, my name is Audrey Tadros from Memorial Sloan Kettering. Thank you all for your talks. It was uh, terrific to hear such uh, up great updates on local regional therapy as also uh, systemic therapy, I think, really is leading the way in improved survival outcomes for these patients. I just wanted to highlight one thing that we didn't talk about is the option for neoadjuvant radiotherapy in these patients who are responding really well to systemic therapy. Uh, we currently have a trial open at Memorial Sloan Kettering looking at these patients and offering them radiotherapy prior to surgery 
so that they could be a candidate to have immediate autologous reconstruction at the time of their surgery, so minimizing the number of surgeries they have and potentially improving quality of life for these patients is the real hope, and we are offering immediate lymphatic reconstruction at the time of their surgery. Thank you. Yeah, that's going to be super exciting. Yeah, well, we've enrolled 15 patients so far, and, and things are, are looking very favorable right now. So thank you all for your time. Wonderful. Thank you. Is it a quick question? It's a very quick question. Okay, last yes. one. <laughs> so I'm Shane Steckland. I'm a radiation oncologist at the University of Kansas. This is a question for Dr. Bellin. In the setting of contralateral axillary METs where you're treating them definitively with surgery and radiotherapy, can you talk about your philosophy as to whether it's necessary to radiate the contralateral breast, which is presumably intact and the cells presumably got there from traversing the dermal lymphatics in the other breast? Yeah, it's a very good question. And um, I'm not aware of any great data to guide us. <clears throat> um, I have, I understand why it is very tempting to radiate in continuity um, because you have to assume that there is, if you're assuming that it is not a true site of distant disease, then you have to assume that there's lymphatic involvement across the whole chest. Um, I have not um, radiated so extensively. It just seems like that would be a lot of um, lung, but I am sure that MD Anderson would consider that. <laughs> um, so what can I say? This is something that comes up you know, very rarely. I've radiated the contralateral side. I have not done it in continuity just because of concerns about toxicity, but I totally understand the rationale and logic for it. And I'm not aware of any data that proves that that is beneficial to radiating just, uh, operating and radiating just the axillary site. Thank you. So I'd like to thank you all for coming. Thank you for those who voted for this to be the people's choice. Thank you to our speakers, and in particular, thank you for the patient advocates, and in particular for everything that you do every day. Thank you.